Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the June 1st, 2016 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. And I'm going to call the meeting to order. And if everyone rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Roll call. Here. Here. Present. Here. Here. We have uh, the baccalaureate uh, for the senior class being held at uh, St. Max's, St. Max's uh, this evening. And so <laughs> we have uh, Chris Caiezo has got a senior, uh, Tom Hall has a senior, and uh, Kate St. Clair can also not make it this evening, sends her regrets. Hopefully we'll see her at the next meeting. Uh, general public comments. Anyone wishing to speak, please approach the podium. End of public comments. Uh, minutes of May 18, 2016, regular meeting. May I have a motion? So moved. moved. Second. Second. Uh, <coughs> any comments or corrections? Noted. None. All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, general public comments. Uh, Finish that. Adjustments to the agenda. Uh, none. Items to be signed. The treasurer's warrants. I have already signed them. Old business. None at this time. New business. <coughs> Order number 16-42. First reading and schedule a planning board public hearing for an amendment to the Town of Scarborough official zoning map to rezone the parcel located off of Southgate Road, identified as map U37, lot 3A, as shown on the town uh, assessor's map from the general business district, identified as the B3 district, to the industrial district, I district. And before we have public comment, we will hear from Karen Martin to introduce the item. Thank you. Good evening. Karen Martin with the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation. Um, I'm here to present a, a potential change to the zoning map. Um, what this change would do is on a lot that's really located right next to a Lear um, in the industrial park, um, next to a Lear and across the street really from the Southgate office condominiums, um, it's been a vacant lot for a while and now Mr. Ray Labonte would like to come in and build uh, something similar to the Southgate um, offices, uh, basically um, a series of five units in a single building that would allow really small manufacturers and um, other uh, people who need flex space to come in and um, use these spaces. Now, this type of space has been very popular um, in the Southgate uh, complex and he's really bringing that style across the street to this particular lot. The difference here is that um, this lot is now in B3, and B3 really doesn't allow for the uh, really manufacturing uses, and we really feel given the shortage of space that we have in the industrial park and the shortage of industrial space throughout the, the town, that allowing industrial and small manufacturers to go in this type of space would be um, a really good service to the community. Um, so again, Mr. Labonte actually is now currently a tenant or um, an own, actually he owns a couple of the spaces over in Southgate. He will be moving once the um, project is completed, if it's um, approved, he would be moving over to um, the new space and still having another three units available for others. It would also free up space at Southgate. Um, so it's a, the acres right now, it's vacant, about 1.6 acres. Again, sort of sandwiched uh, right in uh, next to a Lear, and you can see the back corner of the property is really where Max Deli is. You have um, Fontaine Real Estate, um, and I believe that's a doctor's office uh, right next to that as well. So that's pretty short and sweet. I will entertain any questions. Uh, uh, Karen, would you mind just 
for the public describing what we mean by small manufacturers? I'm sure that is a question people would have. Sure. It really is those um, folks who don't fit into the other zones because they're actually fabricating um, product. For instance, um, there and there are some people who could fit into other zones, but what they really want is that overhead door, sort of that, that flexible space. Um, for instance, in Southgate, you have um, a, like a bio a, a biotech firm that's over there. Um, Biocheck is a perfect example of a company that you might want to see in this space. Um, the reason they're not in office is because they like the open space and really the, manufacture, the manufacturing character. Um, so again, it's very, it's very flexible. You could have landscapers coming in there, um, construction companies, those types of things, and they really benefit from having the overhead door, small office in the back, um, and um, each unit's going to have its own bathroom as well. So it's a really great type of space. <coughs> Other questions of Karen? And Rowan. So I'm understanding correctly that, that it's <coughs> going to be moved into an industrial zone? Correct. And the industrial zone, it, right now, it currently borders an industrial exactly. zone. Exactly. So it's speed. moving at one lot. Right. Okay. Other questions of Karen? Uh, Karen, notice to abutters uh, for this proceeding here at the season? So we, we don't normally do um, notice to abutters here. Um, we would do a public hearing in the planning board, and I may ask Dan for the technical assist. Actually, because it's going from B3, from a commercial zone to an industrial zone, I'm going to ask you to talk about sure. notice. Thank you. Yeah, for the for the planning board public hearing, there's public notice required to go into in the paper um, two weeks before and then a week before the planning board public hearing. Under state law, there is not a requirement for notice to uh, abutters when you're changing a zone from one commercial zone to another commercial zone. There is, like Willowdale, which the council recently considered when you're changing a commercial zone to a residential zone or a residential zone to a commercial zone. <coughs> so under state law, doesn't, doesn't need to be noticed to abutters, but if the council is interesting, interested in having the, no, the abutters notified, we certainly can do that for the planning board public hearing. It's there's not a lot of abutters, so it wouldn't be um, a difficult process. So we, we look for your guidance on that. Uh, it's really more elective than required at this point. I think generally speaking, uh, giving people the opportunity to be aware of something that they may have had an expectation. Sure. Uh, I, I did notice that uh, the, the change has a consistency in that the front, the lots that front on U.S. Route 1 uh, are uh, in the uh, B3 zone. Mm -hmm. And the lots that directly uh, abut them to the rear, uh, mm -hmm. to the east, are in the industrial zone. Yes. And this would be consistent and very much like lot number 31 on the plan that you submitted to us. Sure. Uh, it sits one lot back, so I wanted the public to be aware that there's uh, there's pr uh, certainly it's consistent with the way in which the zoning was originally framed. Yes, indeed. And I'm happy, oh, I was going to say I'm happy to reach out to the um, to the other commercial zone commercial owners along the Route One. I think that would be a good idea. I would like. I think mm -hmm. the council would appreciate mm -hmm. that. Sure. Uh, Thank you. Uh, let's have uh, public comment. Uh, anyone wishing to uh, address this matter, please approach the podium. Uh, see none. Uh, entertain a motion. Pro approval of order number 16 042. Second. Second. Good discussion. This is a first reading, so uh, I think uh, we, generally speaking, are looking more for insight, information, a little bit of education ourselves. Uh, and we'll uh, uh, now send this off to the planning board uh, where we expect it will get a closer view and then back for a second reading before us. So seeing no further comment, uh, all in favor? Oh. Oh. Peter? Sorry, so really just one additional. Yes, go ahead. Did I understand we did ask for that sort of public notice as part of this process? Is we will. Okay. Yes. Right. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Thank you. Good. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Newspaper. 
Order number 16-43, first reading and schedule a planning board public hearing for amendments to the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance regarding multifamily housing allowances and standards in the town's residential districts. Before we take public comment on this, we'll ask the town planner, Dan Bacon, to give us an introduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dan Bacon, Planning Director for the Town of Scarborough. Um, this is a proposed amendment that actually first went to the Long Range Planning Committee and is um, discussed at that level and is recommended to you um, from the Long Range Planning Committee. And it's really to allow for and, and regulate multifamily housing in our, res in our village residential districts. So that's uh, the village residential two, village residential four, and the traditional neighborhood development zones. They're essentially the residential areas around Dunstan and Oak Hill. Um, and it's to regulate multifamily housing by by building size. And this is very similar to what the Council um, and Long Range Planning Committee considered earlier this year. Um, that consideration was in the TVC district, our mixed use zone, where um, the Council approved allowing multifamily housing up to 10,000 square feet of building footprint. Um, so regulating on building size rather than number of units. So this is a similar proposal for these village zones um, where the Long Range Planning Committee is recommending that a consideration be given to allow multifamily housing to not just be um, regulated by number of units, which in the residential zones currently is eight, um, but in inst instead or in addition to allow them to be regulated by building footprint, height, setbacks. Um, and the proposal here is that in these areas, 7,500 square feet of building footprint is recommended and is proposed in the zoning amendment. And as a reference point, um, if you've been through, say, the Dunstan Crossing project or Eastern Village project, project in Dunstan Crossing, there are two townhouses um, that exist when you come into the project. Those are 10,000 square feet. So that's bigger than what we're talking about with this multifamily housing allowance. Um, those are townhouses, and that's, those are allowed to be um, constructed by number of units. Um, this is proposed to be smaller buildings um, of 7,500 square feet of footprint or less to really allow for uh, more flexibility in terms of the type of units that go in these buildings. Um, right now, the market, the housing market is suggesting mm -hmm. that studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms are in demand in Scarborough and in the region. So this would allow for, instead of say eight units in a building, maybe 10 or 12 units in a building, but the building still needs to again be in scale with uh, the residential setting. Um, so as a, as a reference point, and I provided this in the cover, in the cover letter, uh, Camperdown Elm project, which is on Black Point Road, it's right down the road from Oak Hill here, um, has four or five buildings in that project, and the two bigger buildings are pretty much exactly 7,500 square feet. And right now, those have eight units in them. That's the max that was allowed at the time. So in terms of a matter of scale, that's a good project to look at, to say, what is 7,500 square feet? That would give you an example. And what this amendment would do is, say, instead of eight units, that might be two or three bedroom units, um, a project could be developed like that, and maybe there are you know, 10 or 12 one-bedroom units in a building that size. So that's really the intent around the change. It's not to allow more housing density or larger buildings, but rather more kind of flexibility around the number of and type of units that can be in a building. Um, so with that introduction, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Questions for Dan, Councilor Katerina. Um, Dan, could you just talk for the public um, about parking? Because I know I've, I've heard since we discussed this in long range yeah. planning concerns from some people in the public about, if, well, if you're going to allow more units within these buildings, there's going to be more traffic, there's going to be more parking. And, and uh, could you just address how we looked at that? Sure. Uh, in terms of parking, uh, the town treats one bedroom dwelling units different in terms of parking than two or more bedroom units, um, where under our zoning ordinance and through site plan review, the planning board would look at these. Um, one bedroom units are required one and a half parking spaces. 
Um, so if there's an odd number, they have to round up. But um, when you have two or more bedrooms, there's two parking spaces required. So that's how the number of parking spaces would be calculated. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that that's the proper number for a suburban community like Scarborough, um, given that in some cases there's going to be one right. occupant, other cases there'll be two in a one bedroom. Um, and in terms of traffic impacts and, and those implications, uh, I can provide it again to you at, at your public hearing or second reading, but I provided back for the TVC district kind of a breakdown of what are the differences in traffic generation and traffic impacts and essentially what that, those statistics, which are both from Maine and sort of nationally indicate is that um, one bedroom units essentially have half the traffic impact as two, three, four bedroom units. Um, so if you're doing, say, more one bedroom units, um, it's really going to be sort of a wash in comparison to, you know, having fewer larger units with more bedrooms. So. Can I just do Please. a quick follow-up? Um, I, I think it, personally, I'm on long range planning, so we worked on this uh, as a committee, and I'm all for it's more affordable housing we can get in this town and particularly rental units uh, is, is great. My last bit, my only other question for people again who may not understand is what you mean by multiplex? Yeah. Uh, multiplex, well there's, <laughs> the town has a variety of different kind of categories of housing and there's multifamily housing which we're, we're talking about where it's three or more units in a building, um, in one building, and we're talking about allowing multi-family housing to not have a cap on the number of units in the building so long as they meet this footprint limitation and height and other setbacks. We also have a category called multiplex, and that's sort of the historical allowance for kind of condo type um, units or other types of multi-family units, and that's three to eight units Per building, and so I mentioned Camper Down Elm earlier. That's an example of a multiplex project where there's some buildings that have <coughs> six units, some have eight, and there's a variety of other neighborhoods like that. Um, a lot of them are on Eastern Road. There's Whistler's Landing and Cedar Point and um, and Teal Point. There's some others um, in town. So those are multiplex. Often they're arranged kind of horizontally. Um, and then we have townhouses, which you mentioned earlier. Dunstan Crossing has some townhouses. Eastern Village has townhouses. And those are units that have common walls and kind of are vertical units that are in a row. Um, so I hope that yeah. helps kind of clarify the different types of units we have. Uh, so just to follow up on that, so the multiplex, the, uh, the limit still applies. We're only talking about now multifamily. Correct. Gotcha. Um, so the, the VR2, VR4, and TND, you said were only in Dunstan and Oak Hill? Correct. Gotcha. So everywhere would, there would be sewer and water. Right. They're all served by um, public utilities, water and sewer. Yep. That's in the one, one final. Um, and then if I recall when we had the discussion about the uh, town and village center zone, yep. um, that kind of footprint size was already in place? It was. That, okay. So this is just, again, to kind of fit in with the scale of the neighborhood is where we got the 7,500 because we're adding that at this point. Right. In the TVC, commercial buildings were limited to 10,000 square foot building footprint. So the decision was to have multifamily um, duplicate that at 10,000 square feet. In our residential zones, we don't have an overall building footprint limit. So the Long Range Planning Committee looked at sort of the variety of development that's in these areas and felt that the townhouses were okay, but were maybe a little bit bigger than what we perhaps should be allowing for multifamily housing that's not limiting the number of units. So they were, I say, conservative in that regard and notched it down to something <coughs> like 7,500 square feet. Thank you. Councilor Babon. Uh, thanks. A um, couple of questions. Uh, <coughs> first is, um, does this impact at all any of the permitting process than the current projections that we've had or the number of permits that we currently allow? Does this run into any conflict so that you know, um, this might open up a Pandora's box where all of a sudden we have the wrong number of permits available for this type of development. Under the growth management ordinance? Right. Um, 
It should not. There's single family category and then there's multifamily category. So this should still be in keeping with with those categories and shouldn't say create a proliferation of, of multifamily housing. Although I wouldn't mind if the long range planning committee or comprehensive plan looks at those permits mm -hmm. and whether those numbers are still accurate yep. um, and reflect um, an, another value. Um, just to, because um, I've been in one and not the other. So Camper Down, that's the green ones that are on the hill right before the, um, the Eastern Trail, right? Mm -hmm. The Eastern right. Road. Um, are they the same? So on Poland Farms Road, it's called Clearview. I actually lived in one of those. Uh, is that a multiplex or is that considered multifamily? There's like eight units in one building. Those are multiplex as well. Okay. Now, I just want yeah, I just needed to get a visual. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Anything? Can you give us a little bit on the uh, on Sean's question about growth ordinance so that you give a little context for the benefit of the public? Sure. Um, the town has in place and has for a number of years, I think maybe 12 or 14 mm -hmm. years now, um, a growth cap or a building permit yeah. limitation. Every year, the town can only issue a certain number of residential building permits. And uh, that number is at about 135 um, residential building permits per year. And that was put in place back in the early 2000 range um, in reaction to uh, a high volume of residential development that was occurring in the late 90s and early 2000s when the town was seeing 200, 300 um, new residential units a year and it was putting a strain on municipal services, the schools, et cetera. Um, as of the last six or seven years with the recession and with uh, a slower pace of residential development, we haven't been getting close to that limitation. We were getting close or in bumping up into that limitation until about 2007, 2008. So the last six or eight years, uh, we haven't. We have been seeing an uptick in residential mm -hmm. growth and permits. We're, I think, now in the, you know, 80 to, to 95 permits a year the last couple years, ballpark. Um, so there's still, I think, still value in having a growth limitation to pace the town's growth so that services and and the schools kind of keep up um, year to year. Um, but that's, that's essentially why it's in place and what it does. And um, individual developments are only a allocated a certain number a year. So one, a big project can't take all the residential building permits from everyone else in a given year. Um, so there's some checks and balances in it in that regard um, to ensure that developments build out more slowly um, and aren't taking all the permits and, and um, monopolizing that. How, and does there's it, uh, how does it split between re uh, single family residential and multifamily? Um, there's a different treatment of, of multifamily um, where they're allowed more permits because by their nature mm -hmm. they're in, you know, you need to get eight permits all at once or ten permits all at once because you need to build a building at once. Um, so there's allowances for that, and, I, and I, there's sort of a carve-out for multifamily for that reason. Um, there's also a carve-out for elderly-type development because it doesn't have the same demands, at least on the schools. And there's, there's additional allowances for affordable housing. So like the Habitat Project takes permits from a separate pot because that's being encouraged through the Housing Alliance and through the Council over the years in terms of a, you know, the type of housing we want to see in, in some regard. So affordable housing doesn't compete necessarily with market rate housing. Good. Thank you. Councilor Baybun. Uh, Katerina. <laughs> Baybun, did you hear that? <laughs> um, quick question on impact fees. Um, we still have them and how much are they and what sort of construction? Sure. No, that's sort of a, but I, I know that'll come on. I know some people will be thinking that. Yeah, it's all related yeah. right. um, to the, also to the building permit limitation. So, so thanks for mentioning that. There, we, town has since I think the similar time frame, right. uh, late 90s, early 2000s, has um, school impact fees that are assessed at the building permit time um, for residential construction. The fees around four thousand mm -hmm. dollars. 
maybe $4,200 for single family homes. And that is based on the analysis done of the number of school kids that typically is generated out of single family housing. Um, and it is less, it is I think in the $2,000, $2,500 range for two family dwellings based again on analysis around the average um, population of kids in that type of housing. And then multifamily, it, the fee is, is less than that. I think it's in the $1,800 range. And I didn't come exactly prepared, so I can provide you all the, the specifics, but it's in that range for multifamily housing. Again, based on analysis around the amount of occupancy of school age kids in that type of housing. So it's tiered based on based on that analysis. Is it 1800 per unit yeah. in the multifamily? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank That's you. That's my question. <laughs> right, it's not per building, it's per yeah, any, dwelling any, unit. Okay. Any other questions of Dan Bacon? Thank you, Dan. Welcome. Public comment. Uh, anyone wishing to comment on this? Seeing none, we'll close public comment and uh, entertain a motion. With approval of order number 16-043. Second. Discussion? So um, I'm going to uh, really share probably the same reservations I shared um, on the original amendments um, because I first um, I do appreciate the planning board's recommendations and their review process because I know that they're going to be extremely thorough in that. The two things that um, I hope that they address, one is uh, they may or may not be able to as part of this. Um, I want to make sure that um, as we continue to accept amendments to the changes that we're not eroding what is already in the comprehensive plan until the new comprehensive plan um, has been developed, primarily because there is one particular community, which is the Dunson area, that for us, they vote a referendum um, that asked us to limit the amount of growth that was happening. Um, and so I want to make sure that stays intact at least until the next comprehensive plan process goes through its full cycle and that we just don't simply um, erode that. Um, by these type of amendments and then just accept them as part of the comprehensive plan. Um, and the second part of this is that I hope that this actually allows us to look at the broader perspective of um, uh, residential planning because it seems like uh, while I know that it's highly desirable because I live in the Oak Hill area, um, growth in Scarborough really needs to be pushed out. Um, and I hope that um, while this is necessary to um, meet the current needs, I hope that we look at the bigger issue about where other residential, this type of residential housing might be in North or West Scarborough and not just simply in Oak Hill or Dunstan. Other comments? Seeing none, uh, uh, all in favor of the motion? Opposed, unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, no non-action items uh, standing and special committee reports. Uh, Sean, why don't we start down with you? I'm all set for this evening. Thank good. you. Peter? <laughs> Actually, I am also. Have very, any, very good. Any the last time. Councilor Katerina. The only thing I'm going to bring up is the vision committee had our meeting on June 20, excuse me, May 23rd. I don't know what day it is anymore. Um, and that was great. We, all of the uh, members, of boards and committees and whatever got together and had great presentations on what's going on in the community and uh, that's it for me. Councilor Rowan. Yep, so the Housing Alliance met. Uh, we had a very productive meeting. We had a quorum um, hey. for the first time. <laughs> uh, so we actually got a lot done. We elected new officers and um, one of the uh, uh, long-standing action items we advanced, we're not quite there yet, but is to provide some of the <coughs> developers that have um, chosen, elected to uh, take a, an affordable housing density bonus mm -hmm. uh, to provide them some guidance in terms of what that means. Um, and so we're, we're making progress on that. Um, and, um, and that SEDCO also met. Um, we had a very productive uh, discussion. Uh, Mr. Bacon gave a, another presentation of Complete Streets. Um, and we got into a discussion about um, the Hagueth Parkway and it led it to a uh, realization that we need a larger discussion about it. So there's a, a joint meeting of uh, long range planning and SEDCO coming up in, at the end of June um, where we'll get to discuss that in detail. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, 
Town Manager report. Uh, Tom Hall is absent today, so we'll pass over that. And John, why don't we start with Councilor Cummins? I'm all set. Thank you. you. Congratulations to the graduating class. Yes. <laughs> um, same thing. Congratulations, and the vote's coming up. So hope everybody comes out for polls and lets us know what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Katerina. Uh, again, congratulations to those graduating in the class of 2016. Uh, and please remember to vote. You can get your absentee ballots until June 9th. And after that, you have to have a special reason for not <laughs> voting on the 14th. But right. <laughs> well, there's no excuses for not voting, so please vote. Councilor Rowan. So I'm going to echo the same comments. Please vote. Uh, and congratulations to the graduating seniors. Thank you. Uh, Monday was uh, Memorial Day, as you're all probably aware. I think we all have parents or grandparents who uh, endured World War II uh, and uh, think of them fondly, uh, having most of them having passed at this point. Uh, I read a book uh, recently that uh, was a great, great read called Boys in the Boat. Uh, it's a story about... Uh, a group of kids from the great Northwest who went to the University of Washington uh, uh, and uh, participated in their rowing team, their uh, uh, eight oar rowing team. And they made it to the 1936 Olympics where Jesse Owens made that Olympics famous. It was the Berlin Olympics. It was the beginning of the ri rise of uh, Hitler uh, in Europe and the terrible time that resulted from that. Uh, and the author reflected at the end of the book, he went and visited the place where Hitler stood to watch, it was the oar house where the boats were stored, where uh, uh, the boats all passed at the finish line. Uh, and at the end of the book, he was sort of reflecting uh, on uh, uh, what this meant to him to go to that spot. And I just, it's just a paragraph, and I'm going to read it, uh, because it, uh, it says much about our parents and grandparents. Uh, standing there, it occurred to me that when Hitler watched Joe and the boys fight their way back from the rear of the field to sweep ahead of Italy and Germany 75 years ago, he saw but did not recognize heralds of his doom. He could not have known that one day hundreds of thousands of boys just like them, boys who shared their essential natures, decent and unassuming, not privileged or favored by anything in particular, just loyal, committed, and perseverant, uh, would return to Germany dressed in olive drab, hunting him down. They are almost all gone now, the legions of young men who saved the world in the years just before I was born. But that afternoon, standing on the balcony of House West, I was swept with gratitude for their goodness and their grace, their humility and their honor, their simple civility and all the things that they taught us before they flitted across the evening water and finally vanished into the night. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Good evening, everyone. Thank you.